Okay, good morning, everybody. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, we've got 27 participants. I imagine we've got a few more, but let's get started. My name is Noel Gerwick, uh, and uh, I'm the Sustainable Landscapes Team Lead at USAID and Office of Global Climate Change. I'll say a little bit more about USAID's work uh, in a minute, uh, but first I just want to uh, introduce everybody and, and set a few ground rules. Um, our main speaker today will be Rashmi Eka. She is the Food Loss and Waste Lead at Agribusiness Associates. Um, in a minute, I'll introduce Luke Ney uh, from um, Nye, excuse me, from USDA. Some ground rules. This session is being recorded, so um, if you're not comfortable with that, I suppose uh, don't ask any questions, and if you're really not comfortable with that, um, maybe sign off, but we are recording this and we will share the recording with everybody who has registered for this later on. I'm gonna ask, we don't have time to do intros for everybody, but if you could just uh, type your name and your affiliation in the chat box so everybody here has a sense of who else is, is on and interested in this topic, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we are gonna spend five or 10 minutes just going over the goals and the agenda, introducing everybody, and then Rashmi is gonna speak for a while and then we will have some Q&A at the end. Um, if you could during the Q&A keep your video on, that would be great. If you could stay in mute during the plenary, that would be also great. Feel free to use the reactions, the thumbs, thumbs up and the virtual clapping uh, during the presentation, that's fine. But, but just if you keep yourselves, you know, I'll keep ourselves muted to, to uh, allow us all to hear Rashmi, that'd be great. All the products that uh, have come out of this project, uh, this webinar recording, two others, and uh, several documents will be posting on climate, climate links shortly, and we will also send an email to everybody who's registered for this and the other webinars about that. Let me just say before we go any, well, maybe, uh, maybe with that, uh, Rashmi, if I've forgotten anything, please feel free to jump in. But maybe next, let me turn this over to Luke Nye. Luke is the Director of the Development Assistance Branch in the Agricultural Economic Development Division at the Foreign Agricultural Service at USDA. Luke. Thank you, Noel. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about our, our division as well as uh, why we got involved in this, uh, in this project. Um, just a little bit of background, there's been a long history of collaboration between USDA and USAID. Um, USDA collaborates through its uh, technical assistance with its various agencies or through contacts in the US land grant university system. We also provide agricultural technical specialists to USAID here in DC. The Foreign Agricultural Service sees itself as a trade agency that promotes US agricultural exports. The Agricultural Economic Development Division or AED where I work contributes to that mission by applying expertise from within the USDA community to promote agricultural economic development that enables lower and middle income countries to be good trading partners with the United States. AED's programs include those that promote global food security, resilient agricultural systems, science-based decision-making, as well as production and sharing of agricultural data and market information. Our resilient agriculture program has focused on enhancing productivity and income building adaptive capacity, and reducing and removing emissions wherever possible. These goals motivated AED's Resilient Agriculture team to partner with USAID's Sustainable Landscapes team to collaborate on this project to study what is needed to support greater investment in food loss and waste and to identify how food loss and waste could be incorporated into our respective programs. Specifically, we were interested in identifying how we might use the goal of reducing food loss and waste to develop new agricultural products some of which will be discussed today, promote greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and to identify new business opportunities for investments in this effort. And I look forward to having a discussion at the end of this during Q&A on some of these objectives. Today's webinar is the last of three sponsored by this project. Many of you have participated in one or both of the previous ones. The first one in July was a virtual workshop with development practitioners to identify and discuss how food loss and waste criteria could be incorporated into value chain selection. This was an interactive webinar that provided terrific input to the guide for incorporating food loss and waste into value chain selection. The second webinar in August was a soft rollout of that guide, as well as a presentation of other tools from USDA and other federal agencies on reducing food loss and waste. 
The products of those previous webinars, in, ad in addition to those from today's meeting, will be used by AED as we plan new projects. This will also present ways to align our work with USDA's Agriculture Innovation Agenda, which my colleague Otto Gonzalez will elaborate on at the con conclusion of today's webinar. Now I'd like to turn over the virtual microphone to Noel, the team lead of the Sustainable Landscapes team in the Global Climate Change Office at USAID. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Luke, and, and welcome again, everybody, and to those who uh, are just joining now. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about why USAID uh, has uh, embarked on this line of work and why the Sustainable Landscapes team specifically has been working on food loss and waste. Mm -hmm. Sustainable Landscapes, as, as many of you know, some of you may not, has a particular meaning in the climate change world at USAID. Uh, our primary objective, although we work on many development benefits, our primary objective is reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing carbon storage in the land. And so a lot of our work focuses on topics like avoided deforestation, as you might imagine. We also work on agriculture, and we work on agriculture for a couple of reasons. One is that agriculture is a uh, dominant driver of land use change, a dominant driver of deforestation and forest degradation. Agriculture also can contribute and often does contribute greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere, although it also has the opportunity to sequester carbon in the soil. Turns out that food loss and waste is a major ultimate driver of the way that agriculture influences greenhouse gas emissions. The food loss and waste is, uh, is a pretty large percentage of the total amount of food grown. Um, estimates to 30 to 40 percent in some cases. So the more food that is lost or wasted between the field and the plate or the landfill, uh, the more food you have to grow, the more land you have to clear, the more pressure there is on forests, just as an example. The more food that uh, doesn't make it uh, into you know, somebody's mouth, uh, that ends up in a landfill, the more methane is generated in the landfill. So there's a variety of ways that food loss and waste contribute in, in very meaningful ways to greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that's one of the reasons that the Sustainable Landscapes team uh, works on this, on this particular topic. We've been really glad to work with our partners at USDA on this and with Agribusiness Associates in this rather short uh, and very productive project. Uh, and one of the, the, um, the advantages and, and, the, and, and, and of, of working with Agribusiness Associates, one of the parts of this partnership that's been so valuable to all of us, is they are very practical and implementation focused. Um, so a, a lar a, 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 one of the objectives of, of this work that you're gonna hear about today and, and the work that they presented before that Luke mentioned a minute ago, is to make it easier for a variety of actors who work in development programs to incorporate food loss and waste into those programs to increase the amount of literacy and facility with food loss and waste among a broader range of actors in development. With that, I'd like to turn this over to Rashmi uh, and really look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say on these four case studies that you're gonna present and hope everybody else is as well. Rashmi, Rashmi Eka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to speak with you again today. Thanks for joining us. So today, as everyone said, it's the last in the series of uh, webinars. And uh, today we'll be talking about these case studies. So the first one is horticulture in Tanzania. And we'll look at how um, fruits and vegetables uh, have been, you know, the high, very high uh, food loss rate of 30 to 50 percent has been reduced uh, by some of the work done by Taha. The second case, we'll look at palm oil in West Africa. Palm oil uh, is seen as a big driver of deforestation in the Congo Basin. There is food loss in palm oil sector, and we'll see its role in potentially reducing the, uh, the land footprint of this sector. And the third one, we look at some business models for different types of uh, cold storage solutions, very small scale, cool bot powered cold rooms, as well as larger uh, controlled atmosphere cold storage systems. Uh, these two cases will be from Rwanda and India. So let's just uh, get started. So I wanted to show this intervention location uh, value chain map. Um, 
Uh, this is part of our value chain selection guide for food loss and waste. But really, um, on the left hand side, I have farm or upstream actors. And on the right side, we have uh, customers retail, you know, downstream actors. And you see, according to where in the value chain uh, the intervention is, you'll get different types of food loss and waste uh, uh, impacts, different, you know, food security and nutritional goals, as well as planetary health goals will be met. So in the different case studies today, we have, um, you'll see interventions happening across here. So a lot of the, uh, the ones in Tanzania, Tanzania for horticulture, they'll start at the farmer level. There'll be a lot in the middle for um, transportation, logistics, market infrastructure, market access, and even towards the end, towards the customer, where, where we look at more um, export related work. Uh, when in Cameroon for palm oil, most of the interventions will be placed in the middle of it here. They will be around processing, and um, that you know has to do with um, more food loss and waste employment and entrepreneurship and increased food availability. For cold storage, uh, that can happen close to the farm, in the middle of the value chain, as well as towards the end. Really, cold storage should be put where um, food is waiting the longest and accordingly, it'll have um, different impacts. So with that background, we'll launch into Taha. Uh, Taha's case study, uh, which is you know, Tanzania's horticulture sector. So a quick background about Tanzania. It's a top 20 producer of vegetables in the world. It has had really an astounding growth from $64 million in 2004, this is exports, to $779 million in 2019. And the country has an aim to increase exports to 3 billion in the next five years. Uh, horticultural growth is about 11% per annum. Um, compared to the agriculture growth, which is just 4%. And the sector mostly employs women and really, um, of, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people in Tanzania. Tanzania is very blessed to have a both temperate and tropical climate, as well as different altitudes and temperatures. So they're really able to grow a very wide variety of fruits and vegetables, which they can uh, consume locally, as well as export. So Taha is a member-based trade association. It was established about 16 years ago. And um, they have uh, many members, which are largely large producers, exporters, processors, agro inputs, and other service providers, as well as several, you know, um, thousands of smallholder farmer groups and associations. Taha has partnered with both USAID and USAID for close to 10 years. And a lot of that work has focused on disseminating good agricultural practices to smallholders and farmer co-ops. <clears throat> We've also worked to strengthen Taha's advocacy role for um, you know, several of the value chain actors, uh, both for national level consumption as well as uh, international exports. Um, Taha's key focus areas is enhancing the enabling business environment, increasing access to markets, increasing productivity and competitiveness, promoting public-private partnerships and horticultural investments, market information systems, establishing market support infrastructure, and technical support services. The main sectoral challenges related to food loss in Tanzania is that there's very low, uh, there has been in the past low capacity for post-harvest quality management and production techniques. Uh, it's estimated that post-harvest loss for domestic market is at 40%, and for the export market, it's much lower at 10%. Uh, the, the produce quality has been low and there's been low safety assurance, improper packaging materials, materials, poor traceability systems, 
inadequate financial services and unreliable transportation with long wait times. So these are some of the challenges that Taha has tried to work on. So what we did for this case study is we looked at all of Taha's work and we tried to see which of those um, fell within uh, reducing food loss. And uh, this, is, this is what we came up with. We just realized that their strategies around capacity building building market access, market infrastructure, and export services. So starting with capacity building, Daha has 21 um, regions in which they work in Tanzania, and they have agronomists in all of these regions. Now you may well know that extension systems are very poor in several developing countries. Um, and when they do exi exist, they're often for grains and not, not for horticulture. So for Daha to be working so deeply in horticultural extension, as well as uh, providing specific post harvest harvest related training is really huge in, in increasing the quality of production starting from the farm level. We spoke to Daha agronomists and, and understood their production techniques that they're working on for higher quality, as well as the post-harvest management and handling practices that uh, they're providing training on. Uh, several low cost uh, or you know, behavior oriented practices, such as use of shade, harvesting in the early morning, as well as um, you know, low cost technologies such as charcoal coolers, forced air cooling, hydro cooling, um, as well as a focus on proper uh, storage practices. For market access connecting smallholders um, to both local markets, processors, big buyers and exporters is really important. So they've done a lot of work in providing these uh, marketing linkages. Uh, uh, we're ex especially delighted to see the work in linking to processors. Processing is really very key because you know whenever harvest happens, there's a huge supply and uh, often a lot of it can go to waste if there's no way to process it and keep it for the long term. Uh, Taha also has an initiative called Fresh to Market, which is linking smallholder farmers with buyers in retail, and this focuses on packaging. Under market infrastructure, uh, Taha Fresh is a big initiative, and this mostly works on logistical services, again, with a, uh, an export focus. Um, they also have strategically placed collection centers and pack houses in, in several places. And the thing with collection centers and pack houses is, is that it, it provides a central aggregation point for farmers where a lot of quality management can happen. So this is where sorting, grading, as well as temperature control can happen. So uh, collection centers um, are, are really important market infrastructure. Under export services, Taha does export related lobbying. They have uh, another arm called GreenSet, which provides um, inspection services as well as does a lot of producer training uh, and certification. Taha also collaborates with government agencies, um, especially on, with the post harvest management team uh, at the Ministry of Agriculture. Testimonies from farmers. So we spoke to some farmers who've been working with Taha. Um, on the right, we have a photo of a charcoal cooler. This is a low cost uh, temperature management solution where using charcoal and evaporation, we're able to reduce the temperature inside this room. And, and below you have um, a screen house, which is a, a way to protect the produce from um, you know, insects and pests. So uh, Nita has been helping farmers build these, farmer associations um, build these. And uh, with these kinds of low cost solutions, as well as the capacity building training, farmers are able to reduce reduce their loss, um, you know, from say 50 to 60% uh, to five to 10%. And this is really quite huge at the farm level. Uh, uh, if you're able to um, have good quality produce from the beginning, from the farm itself, that has, you know, kind of exponential returns as the, the product moves from the farm to the market. 
Uh, this is, uh, we spoke to Isaac, who is a Taha Regional Agronomist uh, from Dar es Salaam. I know there's a lot of text here. We just left it in there uh, for your reference later on. But uh, about him, what I want to share is that, you know, he's been working uh, in the Dar area with 261 farmers and has, it, you know, done a lot of this capacity building and technical assistance for developing these low cost um, solutions uh, there. And uh, it's interesting that he says, you know, earlier it was taught that this region is not conducive for farming, but uh, they've shown that, you know, good, good and big farming can be done in this area. Uh, the main challenge has been access to markets and uh, exports are limited by our infrastructure port and flight limitations. Uh, so a lot of lot more work needs to be done in making the market the, the environment more conducive and to reduce the costs. And processing is another area of focus, he says. Um, there's constant production of many crops throughout the year, and they need to be processed for value addition for long-term storage. COVID-19 has had quite an impact, uh, especially on horticultural markets. Um, you know, exports were stopped uh, March to early June. A lot of food was wasted at the borders. Um, for example, there were uh, early in that lockdown period, there were like 150 trucks at the Kenya border with oranges, which, which just went bad. Uh, so a lot of, um, uh, impact, especially on the fresh fruits and veg industry. Uh, tourism came to a standstill. Also, there was a st shortage of imported agro inputs uh, and that led to a price increase. There's some anecdotal evidence of uh, positive impacts of COVID-19 though, and that is that consumers have been eating more fruits and vegetables uh, to improve their nutritional status during the pandemic, as well as producers have been finding alternative marketing systems like home delivery um, and trading through social media and, and that we've seen in uh, several developing countries. Okay, next uh, we will move on to palm oil uh, in Cameroon uh, and, and the possible role of reducing food loss in reducing deforestation. So a quick background, uh, the oil palm, palm area, uh, so the land used for growing palm oil is 200,000 hectares in Cameroon. Um, it, it, there's been a lot of expansion in this uh, growing area in the last 20 years, and 67% of this is has been at the expense of forests. So farmers are, are able to clear forests and, and put their palm oil plantations there. This um, big expansion has been um, driven by a Im booming informal sector. Um, and we also noticed that deforestation is greater around artisanal mills than you know, agro-industrial mills. So we'll talk a little bit more about what these artisanal mills are and, and the difference with the industrial mills. Food loss in palm oil is, um, it, it, it happens on the farm and then it happens at the processing stage. So at the farm, it's uh, mostly about uh, harvesting unripe fresh fruit bunches. And at the processing stage, it's about um, poor processing efficiency, which leads to lower extraction rates. Uh, the other issues are around lack of infrastructure for farmers to be able to get their palm um, fresh fruit bunches to higher performing mills because of lack of access to roads and uh, the lack of anti-deforestation legislation. I do want to note here that a lot has been written about palm oil and its impact on deforestation. In this case study, we will only focus on the role of food loss in, in the palm oil sector and, and you know, because the sector is quite big, so our focus is just on food loss here. So on-farm loss. Uh, on-farm loss can be estimated to be between five to 10% uh, in, in Cameroon and in Gabon, it's 8.7%, it's so it falls in the same range. Uh, this is a Again, mostly because the what has been harvested is underripe. It's just been harvested too early, and this is just discarded at the farm. 
unripe bunches are harvested because the, the harvesters are either not trained properly or because the farm floor is not clean. If, if the way harvesters know that a tree is ready for harvest is when they see loose nuts on the floor near the tree. So if they can't see that because if there's a lot of weed, uh, then they won't know um, if, if the tree is ready for harvest. Given the extraction rate, and the extraction rate is very wearing, it's between 12 to 21 percent, um, you know, then this 10 percent really is just a very small fraction of the palm oil loss. So in Cameroon, farmers uh, tend to own their own mills. This is especially the case if the farmers are far away from the industrial mills. So several farmers um, extract their own. They have uh, either manual mills like this one in this photo, which has an extraction rate of 12%, or a semi-motorized mill, which can have an extraction rate of 16%. Farmers are forced to do their own milling because uh, they don't have good transportation options. Roads are poor, so they're not able to get their fresh fruit bunches to the agro-industrial mills. They also have lower processing costs and a higher sales margin if they mill and sell their own. So, you know, there, there is an um, advantage for farmers to do their own selling, uh, milling and selling. And also farmers need to aggregate their produce because the, the big mills need high volumes. And um, so farmers need to organize uh, to be able to facilitate uh, you know, that market access to the big mills. Here we have three different types of producers um, and you know, what really happens in the market with their extraction rate. So first we have the non-industrial sm small holder farmer. Um, they have a lower yield because of uh, using uh, low, low quality planting material and they get about uh, eight tons per hectare. That's the yield. Uh, more advanced, still non-industrial farmers can, can get say between eight to 12 uh, tons per hectare. And then uh, the industrial plantation is, uh, they get 15 uh, tons per hectare for their yield. Going over this OER is the oil extraction rate. So a non-industrial small, small holder farmer will have an oil extraction rate of 12%. A more advanced one will have an oil extraction rate of 16%. And at the industrial plantation level, the oil extraction rate is 21%. So you see there's quite a big of, um, you know, quite quite a, a big difference between these oil extraction rates. Uh, and this is really, this oil extraction rate or this, this loss related to the inability of being able to get the most amount of oil from the fresh fruit bunches is really the food loss in, in this sector. Uh, the main scenarios for reducing loss based on the oil extraction rate is, is to try and upgrade all of the 12% the mills, these very manual artisanal mills to, to go up to a higher uh, level of extraction. So they can be converted to, you know, upgraded to get to more of a 16% extraction rate. Um, as well as really just installing more high performing mills in these areas where deforestation is happening and there are no, uh, not many industrial mills, but you know, where the artisanal mills and the small holder farmers are proliferated. So th that's where there's a case of um, upgrading the artisanal mills as well as install installing more high performing mills with uh, that similar extraction rate of 21% which the very big industrial mills get. Uh, the other things also is to use cooperatives as a, as a good intervention point. Cooperatives could possibly have some of these high performing mills, as well as investing in roads to connect smallholder farmers to these mills. Can I check on the time? Okay, I'm doing fine.
Now we, we will talk about the, the third um, case study, and this is focused on cold storage and controlled atmosphere storage. Uh, two business models from Rwanda and India to show you. So the first question is really where to place cold storage or a temperature management solution within the value chain. Uh, here I just have a simplistic value chain uh, diagram for you. So starting from farmer, aggregator, wholesaler, processor, retail. So for every um, crop, this, this looks you know, a little bit different, right? Like where is that storage uh, need? Is it just for a, a short-term hold while there's some kind of a delay, in which case it could be at the farmer level or the, the wholesale level, or is it you know, at the processor um, where the produce is coming in, but there's some like, time before they can get into the processing, or if it's even closer to the retail level. Um, oftentimes, folk thinks that the that the whole chain needs to be a cold chain, but in several developing countries, that's not realistic. And there's also the climate change impact um, of cooling solutions. So I think it's really important to see where the longest wait time is happening, uh, and where the produce is uh, or the crop is uh, has the more, most chance of being impacted by heat and henceforth uh, there's a rapid deterioration and place uh, cold storage or temperature management solutions there. So the first story I have is from Rwanda. This is uh, Serge Ganza. He has an improved market center called Africa. Uh, well, his company's name is Africa Food Supply. And um, he's a, an agronomist and an entrepreneur. And um, he has a cold room. And he also practices several other uh, good you know, food loss uh, reduction practices, as well as post-harvest storage so on the left here, uh, this is the picture of his market. And in the back over here, in the left back, he has a cold room. The cold room he has is powered by CoolBot, which is a small bot. Uh, and it tricks a regular AC to, to go down to, um, you know, between 32 to 36 Fahrenheit. So the cost of constructing this uh, cold room in Rwanda is about $3,500. That includes um, an, an air conditioner, that cool bot, um, as well as insulation for a room. So it's really a very low cost way of getting a cold room. And uh, the reason that this cold room has been installed at a retail point is really that's where farmers, um, you know, put out or not farmers, sellers put out their produce and they display it. And there's a long wait time, there's heat. Uh, and that's where a lot of the produce is going bad. So um, it's, it's really a strategic location for having a cold room. So at his market, uh, seven cooperatives sell their produce. Uh, he buys some of it and sells it. And, and he also has tables out, which uh, the cooperatives can can rent and sell. Uh, Serge really has um, a, quite a holistic solution uh, where he is because he also trains the farmers on good production post-harvest handling practices and has also helped them install low-cost cooling technologies like the zero energy cool chamber which is a simpler version of the charcoal uh, cold chamber that you notice in the Tanzania study. Uh, this one uses just bricks and sand. So it's, it's smaller and lower cost. Uh, Serge reports that, <clears throat> you know, uh, additionally, he also procures his uh, vegetables using a truck and crates instead of uh, big baskets, and that also has helped reduce his loss. So he says, you know, with with all of the handling, the sorting, uh, temperature management, good practices, his loss is close to zero. Now we'll talk about apples in cold storage and controlled atmosphere storage in India. So food loss in apples is quite high at 10 to 25%. The primary causes are poor post-harvest practices, 
Uh, many growers, after harvesting their apples, they just had to store them in their orchards and because of high temperatures and, and humidity issues, um, they, they would often go bad. So what farmers have to do is that they just have to sell during the season because they don't have an ability for you know, longer term storage because there was low cold storage and controlled atmosphere cold storage. The big impact of this is uh, because of lack of storage solutions, the shelf life is lower, the season for apples is lower, and the price is also lower because there's a huge glut during the season, prices go down, farmers are not able to get good prices, and then for the rest of the year, there's a shortage. So, um, and you know, it also goes to, there's also produce that goes to waste uh, towards the, in the season where um, you have a wad and you're not able to move the product as fast. Controlled atmosphere storage is um, kind of a natural process where it's a, it's a cold room uh, where the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide is set in a way so that uh, the best way I hear it explain is that the apples just go to sleep. So the oxygen is really lowered a lot and the, the apples go to sleep and so um, the, the ripening uh, process doesn't happen. Um, so when the apples come out of controlled atmosphere and they can be in here for nine to 12 months, they're still, you know, crispy, crunchy, juicy apples. Uh, this photo here, you'll see there are different chambers. So uh, there are different chambers and then um, the owner of the apples in the controlled atmosphere can open up a certain chamber when they're ready to sell it. And, and then the rest of the chambers and their um, you know, controlled atmosphere uh, is not disturbed. Uh, apple control atmosphere in India. So this is uh, fairly new. This has really been happening in the last uh, 10, 15 years. There is some installed capacity in uh, Himachal Pradesh, Delhi, and Jammu and Kashmir, but it's really just about 10% of the total production. The cost of a fully automated, modern control atmosphere system with a grading and packing line, uh, you know, which is 5,000 ton is $4.7 million. Uh, the central government as well as the state government have different financial assistance subsidies in the uh, $680,000 to $2 million range. Uh, speaking to a few of owners of the CA systems, we see that they can typically achieve break even in five to six years, uh, depending upon the utilization of the cold storage. They are typically owned by large traders, wholesalers, as well as agribusiness investors and big corporations. The apples which are kept in these storage systems can be owned by the farmers or the traders or even the, the CA owners. And the government is now planning to invest in these uh, controlled atmosphere storage uh, at the block level so that they're more accessible to small, small farmers and orchard owners. I have some apple math here uh, just to, to show you uh, how the price has increased over you know, the last um, 15 years or so. So there's a you know big jump in price, um, but what's more interesting to me is the spread of the price. So earlier, fresh apples, uh, which are sold between August to December, would sell at 40 rupees per kg. And then January to March, you would have apples come out of cold storage, and then they would go for like say 70 rupees per kg. And these are all wholesale prices. And then uh, the controlled atmosphere apples, which is cold storage plus carbon dioxide, they would come out in April, July, and they would be 100 rupees a kg. So the spread is quite high. It's, you know, like a $60, 60 rupees difference. In 2019, uh, the fresh apples were going for about 90 rupees a kg, and then the ones um, from the controlled atmosphere were going for 130 rupees per kg. So the spread has become smaller. It's, it's more like 40 rupees a kg. And, and, and the, big, the, the, the main idea here that I wanna share is that because of the increase in the cold storage and the controlled atmosphere um, storage, 
because of this increase in storage, the prices throughout the year have kind of stabilized a little bit. There's a price smoothening effect and, and several players are profiting from that. Uh, this, the huge profit though, it's really made by downstream actors uh, who, who own the control atmosphere. Uh, so these are the traders, the wholesale buyers, um, not necessarily the apple or the, the smallholder farmers over here, but definitely even the fresh apples are going for a higher price. Uh, like I said, there's a smoothening uh, effect. Um, and here I, I have some, uh, an example of, you know, what, uh, how much profit can be made on um, one kg of apple after being stored in, in cold storage. Impacts of COVID-19. So apples have al always been considered a high value fruit in India, but during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, they've almost become a luxury item. And this is mainly because of supply issues. There was lower production this year, um, but the rate has gone down as you know, de demand was not as expected. Uh, prices uh, this summer were 105 rupees per kg versus 130 rupees per kg last summer. And um, a lot of this is also because transportation has been a challenge, interstate travel has been hard, and um, you know there's like there's 14 days of quarantine between interstate travel, and also a lot of uh, produce was stuck during the the 72 day lockdown that we had from between you know, end of March to May 31st. So in closing, I'd just like to try to bring these pieces together. Um, you know, I presented three case studies, um, sort of four maybe uh, with the Rwanda and India cold storage. And we chose these case studies for these reasons. The first, you know, Taha in Tanzania illustrates how reducing food loss is complex. It's a holistic approach is needed and food loss work is intrinsically tied to value chain development work. The second is a palm oil in Cameroon. It illustrated the impact that one intervention during the processing phase of palm oil can have a very big impact on, on food loss in the value chain and have global impacts on climate. And the third and the fourth, you know, the two, the, the low cost cold storage and the very high, you know, high cost of uh, high sophisticated, high sophistication uh, control atmosphere solution shows the business case for you know, two contrasting situation. Um, one very small scale, one very large scale to, to give you an idea of how these business models can work. We chose these case studies somewhat opportunistically, um, you know, to show different situations where food loss and waste can occur. Uh, we believe that they are valuable because they introduce several different concepts, which are really key to reducing food loss, starting from production, post-harvest handling, processing, supply chain, um, low cost as well as high cost uh, technology solutions, market access and market infrastructure, exports, and enabling environment. So with that, um, I thank you all. Uh, here is our contacts. <clears throat> um, the USDA team uh, is currently being led by Anna Torres. Formerly, it was led by Caitlin corner -Dolliff. She's now in transition, but by the time um, we're able to update and send out this, uh, publish this. Uh, hopefully we'll have her new email ID. Uh, we have Noel Gervik from USAID and my contact is here. With that, I'll turn it over to Noel to help us, uh, who will moderate the q and Rashmi, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, mostly I think uh, we're turning it over to all of you. I I'll moderate, but happy to, take about 15 minutes for questions that anyone might have. I do wanna add, uh, everything you just heard Rashmi present, our first conversations with agribusiness associates happened in early April. That was before we had any clear scope of work agreed upon. So they've done all of this work in a very short period of time. And, and we've been so uh, pleased with the amount of productivity and insight and uh, quality that, that we've gotten in that, 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 that 
the U.S. government has gotten in such a short period of time working with them. So we really appreciate that. Uh, there have been a number of questions, <laughs> excuse me, in the chat box. Some of them answered, some of them not. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, or I'm actually not sure I can see the hand raise feature on my screen. So if you want to type a question or just your name even into the chat box, and then we will know to, um, to address your questions, that would be helpful. Ahmed, uh, Ahmed had a question about sharing data sources. Uh, I'm assuming, Rashmi, can you see the chat box as well at this point? Um, he's looking about, uh, and I'm assuming we can share all those data without, without difficulty. Right? Yeah, and if uh, folks want to turn on their video so we can have a more um, dis you know, discussion, that would be great too. <clears throat> Questions from anybody, just type your name in the chat box and we will put you in the queue and call on you and have some of this discussion from the uh, chat box move into uh, verbal. Okay, I'm gonna pick on Kurt since he, uh, he wrote the last question in the chat box. Kurt Reedsma uh, asked, are you looking at a comparative negative environmental impact of adding a mechanism to these supply chains? So oil presses and cooling systems vis-a-vis -vis the impacts of food loss. Assume we are still gaining, but can you verify that? Kurt, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that, sorry, that should read mechanization, not mechanisms. Uh, we're, we're adding, adding um, engines, I guess, to uh, the oil presses. We're adding all these cooling units. There must be some negative environmental impacts there as well as, as the positive env environmental impacts we're going after uh, by preventing food loss. Right. So we have not done a, a you know a greenhouse gas uh, net cost benefit kind of an analysis here uh, about you know whether um, the the food loss and waste reduction um, merits the the increase in mechanization. Um, other work though does show that. Um, because there are several impacts here, and, and the biggest one being the land footprint. So for this is for Cameroon, right? So the, the biggest one being the land footprint of, of palm oil that, you know, reducing, um, increasing the productivity of that extraction rate will decrease that land footprint. And that is really the biggest driver of greenhouse gas emissions over here. So yes, more work needs to be done in that. Uh, to figure that out. About a uh, cold chain, um, again, as I, I emphasized, uh, we, we don't need cold chain throughout, um, you know, many chains in developing countries. We really need them at just at the strategic points where high wastage is happening. Uh, so then that, again, helps uh, reduce that uh, greenhouse gas emission load from the waste produce as well, not just, you know, from um, the, the cold uh, cold storage solution. So so on the other side is um, you know all of the natural resources that go into producing the food itself, the water, the energy, and all of that. And then when the food goes bad, that too has um, an impact through emissions. Um, so I, I know some researchers are working on on figuring out where their balance is. Uh, we haven't been able to do that in this case study, but um, yeah. That's, um, Thank you. I guess I could add one, a couple of thoughts to that answer. Uh, it might depend on the particular value chain you're working on. If you're working on the dairy value chain, for example, emissions from dairy are so high uh, that it's inconceivable to me that the added emissions, if it's a fossil fuel powered uh, cold storage facility, is going to come close to uh, the, the gains that you would make from the cold storage. Uh, in general, uh, what I was trying to get at at the beginning, so I, I remember seeing a presentation when the fourth IPCC assessment, when the fifth IPCC assessment report was released, looking at the benefits you get from lots and lots of different ag practices on the field, and then the benefits you get from addressing food loss and waste. And we've historically put a lot of effort into these uh, on the field practices, uh, looking at you know small variations in a practice, all of those in this particular presentation 
accompanying the, the release of that IPCC report showed that we really were missing the boat. And looking at these, what are called sometimes demand side drivers, have a much bigger impact. So while I imagine you might be able to find some cases where that balance sheet would show in this particular one benefit of cold storage, uh, it going in the direction of in sticking with the loss and waste uh, that we have, in general, I think I would be really surprised. Uh, and the other point that Rashmi alluded to is the sustainable landscapes perspective has, has one, you know, we, have, we have a climate change perspective on this, but we also are working with a range of development benefits and food security benefits. And you know, we don't always, we don't, we, we, don't, we don't want to ignore all of those others. So the cold storage gives you all these other increased benefits in, in, in many cases. Sorry to go on about that. Uh, Kate. I have, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Lourdes. I have a, a question. Just a, a wonder, Rajmi. Excellent presentation, and thank you. I've been to you know, the previous one, and, and this is really an interesting area that you guys are exploring. I wanted to ask, have you, and no, this is for you too, have you um, tried to look into food waste to like look at the other side of, you know, not just a food loss. Are you thinking about doing it? And, and obviously specifically in, in the developing country? Because there is, a, I feel like there is an assumption that food loss is important, but when you look at numbers, food waste is also really complicated and big. Yes. <laughs> Yes, food waste is uh, really food waste. Uh, um, uh, let, let me split the difference. Food loss is from production till retail and food waste is, um, you know, past uh, retail. Usually the consumer or the um, um, uh, restaurant level uh, waste and uh, that is quite high. So uh, the FAO um, work uh, has provided us with really good data uh, about where uh, food loss happens and where food waste happens. And um, recently, um, Heike Axman's uh, group at uh, Wageningen University, they've been working also to see where um, food loss and fair food waste happens in the developing countries. We can share a link to her work. They, they try to map the hotspots along the value chain. And, and we do see uh, through their work that um, in, the, in the developing country context, food loss is a bigger problem than food waste. Um, th this, this data uh, is, is new to us. We, we've just been reviewing it in the last uh, month or so uh, since it's been published. Earlier also, it was thought that, you know, food loss is higher in developing countries and food waste is higher in developed countries. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there was some question around this because a lot of waste does happen at the household level in developing countries as well. And that's because by the time you bring the, the food home, it's, it's, it's almost dead and it, it dies very quickly at home. You know, you, you have to eat it the same day or the next day where it goes bad. But it's encouraging to see that, um, you know, food waste may not be that big of a problem. So, um, Daniel. Yeah. Daniel, did you have a question? Should I look in the chat or? Um, no, let's keep going on. Andrew, we'll come back to Daniel. Hi there. Great. Um, so thanks for an awesome presentation. Um, my question is around um, the, the cold chain infrastructure is expensive, but delivers a system level quite a big benefit, which the burden of paying for it falls on the processor or the, or the aggregator. Are there, are there any sort of policy interventions or examples where sort of carbon financing has been brought in to, to try to sort of catalyze further investment in cold chain? I actually don't know of any examples. So, anyone? No, I can come in. I yeah. can come in there. Like government of India, they they gave in some of the 
subsidies for setting up the coal state and then the state government also chipped in so jammu uh, the jammu and kashmir that's an north indian state so people get uh, close to uh, 23 25% subsidy in setting up this infrastructure which has increased the number of control atmosphere storage is over there and the the other good thing about it is when you increase the infrastructure in the particular area uh, at the beginning of the season even though the normally the prices are lower but because people are storing it the supply chain get uh, less apples the farmers also are benefited as rashmi said uh it's basically the traders and the coal chain operators who who make the most but because of the these coal chains uh even the farmer get a higher price bill can you go back to the beginning of what you said um because um i mean i think andrew's question was specifically about carbon financing and that's that's the piece of your answer that i missed at the very beginning i'm not sure, and maybe others did too uh so i uh, coming back to that the, there was uh, quite a fiscal support by the central government and then the different states also supported differently to set up these infrastructures which okay. has which has resulted in increased capacity and uh, which in turn when i ask the question in journal the traders and the coal store uh, the control atmosphere store, uh, people made money but because these are there the people are putting the apples there even the farmers are getting better realization right though though a small farmer is not able to store at that place but this is an example of uh, you know government level subsidy not a, a carbon finance um It's but that's carbon finance. yeah that we can uh, look into andrew and get back to you i think that's a really interesting question i think we have time uh, for one last question um and thank you for all of the discussion in the chat with all kinds of interesting side side discussions in the chat uh kate you have the last question and then we'll give the florida auto for uh for a couple of minutes of uh closing remarks. Hi, uh they sort of answered my question in the chat a little bit, but maybe you guys can talk a little further about it. I asked if there were any explorations of alternative supply chains. So, when you have I see more like about the fresh fruit, would it it can't be sold as fresh fruit? Uh could it be turned into something like jam that's a little bit more shelf stable and do those supply chains exist? Are they being supported, explored? sort of what's the thinking around that thing yeah i think entrepreneurship and financing of uh processing is really important in africa so in tanzania you know taha i did mention that they're trying to connect farmers uh to processors um i know they're making jams and juices uh and also dried i think it's dried pineapples uh in the project that agribusiness associates did in rwanda uh with the support of horticulture innovation lab um we did an entrepreneurship a post harvest innovation competition where we awarded 13 entrepreneurs and i would say i don't know maybe 8 or 9 of them were all you know processors they were doing chili oil um tomato uh paste um uh jams um avocado oil things like that you know yes when when there is that when harvest comes i mean that is really the time to move things into processing so that you can use it throughout the year it has huge financial as well as nutritional benefits um including uh you know low cost sort of at home or um cooperative scale of processing like produce that can really have uh nutritional impacts during the 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 dry season Okay, thanks for Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Otto, Otto, uh, Otto Gonzales is the senior director of the Ag Economic Development Division, Division in Global Programs at Foreign Ag Service at USDA. Uh Otto, uh you have a couple of couple of words for us here before we uh before we all sign off. Sure, thanks Noel, thanks Rashmi. Uh wonderful presentation. You know, you know often we're we're imagining better ways 
to uh, be the growing world, we're always thinking about increasing agricultural productivity and perhaps thinking about great strides we can make in plant breeding or animal breeding. But um, what we've seen here, certainly in the studies that Rashmi's done and other studies like that, that we can really increase productivity mainly by not losing what we already have. Um, you know, quite quite easily, even by, by 10 or, or 15 percent, just by reducing uh, food loss and waste. And as we've seen here, many of the tools that we need, we already have. So we really have great, great potential here. And I think overall, what we want to do is take what's often been an afterthought and make it a forethought. That really um, trying to reduce food loss and waste should be inherent right up front. In, in what we're doing, particularly if we want to try to help countries be, be resilient and food secure and really have a reduction in uh, environmental impacts of greenhouse gas emissions in particular. So what I'd like to mention very briefly is that, you know, in USDA this year, we've unveiled an agriculture innovation agenda and it's very ambitious. It aims for U.S. agriculture by uh, 2050 to uh, improve agriculture by 40 percent and environmental impacts by half and the food loss and waste within that is even more ambitious because the thought is to try to reduce food loss and waste in the United States by 50 percent by 2030 10 years from now and uh, so within the department our agricultural research service is investing in a lot of research in this area has come up with some uh, for example innovative freezing technologies to reduce food loss and waste uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture is investing in research. And a lot of this is, also takes place with the land grant universities. And I know that, for example, University of California Davis, which uh, Rashmi cited the uh, CoolBots uh, uh, work, that was done, which is a land grant university, which we invest in, and also the USDA invests in, and then you invest in it, particularly through the Horticulture um, Be the Future Innovation Lab. So there's lots of great things that USAID and USDA can do, you know, partnering together. And uh, we aim in our division, the Agricultural Economic Development Division, in the work that we do with, uh, with USAID, to really see how we can find uh, all these different kinds of innovations that are being developed within USDA and beyond with respect to reducing food loss and waste and really bring it into our work and resilient agriculture with uh, with UL at USAID. Really appreciate the partnership with uh, with USAID, and we were happy through the support that you gave us to be able to partner with Agribusiness Associates and and have the wonderful work that Rashmi and her team have done. So Noel, really thank you very much for all the great support that you provided and everything that's coming from the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Uh, Rashmi, thank you for your studies. I'd also like to thank our team here at USDA, uh, Anna, Paige, and Caitlin for all their work with you. So thanks, and let's, let's look forward to all we can do together to reduce food loss and waste. Thanks so much, Otto. I know we're a couple minutes over. For those of you who had questions we didn't get to, feel free to email me or Rashmi. Or we will address them and get back to you. Uh, and also want to ditto Otto's Thanks to the team at USDA as well. Really a remarkable effort on, on your part. Not a huge group of people and got a lot done in a short period of time. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.